Uh, read for me, start again. Uh, um. So what will happen now is that we'll have the second talk and then Simon will come back to us uh, uh, towards the end. So uh, our second talk is by Catherine Morris, who is uh, known to all of us. Um, Catherine is a Supervisory Fellow at uh, Mansfield College in Oxford. She um, works mainly on Wittgenstein, but is also on serious work on the day club together with Gordon Baker, uh, whose work uh, she also um, helped put together as well. Uh, she's also uh, written on Murray Comte extensively, and I believe lately also in, in the domain of, of um, um, medical anthropology, so together with Bill Fullford, uh, the editor of the um, <coughs> International Perspectives of Philosophy and Psychiatry series. And, so, and today you will talk to us about, I don't actually know the title. It, it, it's, it's called Melopunty and Wittgenstein on Understanding, quote, other others. And I will try to explain what that means. Um, so um, Simon was sort of engaging with, uh, with uh, and the uh, plus of language, and part of what I'm going to do here, uh, this really is for philosophers and ethnomethodologists may or may not get anything out of this. Um, but as a, so I'm going to be engaging with uh, analytic philosophy of mind in a certain way. Um, but I should also say that um, there's the part of this paper that's written and the part of the paper that isn't, so to speak. And um, the part of the paper that isn't is really much more on the Wittgenstein aspect. But it's, it's those, uh, I'm, I'm going to say a few things about Wittgenstein, uh, partly during the talk and uh, during the, what, what I say about Miller Party, but mostly afterwards. But it's, the, it's those comparisons that I would quite like to be able to develop, and I'm just beginning to do that. But there's so much to say about Meloponti that hopefully that will be enough to be getting on with, at least. Um, so I begin just by relating uh, what I'm talking about to what analytic philosophers of mind co uh, call, quote, the problem of other minds. Um, and there are various questions that might be addressed under that general banner. Most familiar is uh, an epistemological problem that's typically expressed as, how do we know that minds other than our own exist? Uh, there's another epistemological problem, which may be expressed, how do we understand others' minds? How do we know what they're feeling and thinking and so on? And there's also what's sometimes called the conceptual problem of, of other minds, which is something like, can we have a concept of mind and of, of mental concepts, which perforce applies generally and unambiguously to oneself and to others? Uh, and Meloponti has something to say about all of these questions, although uh, not exactly put in those ways. His remarks amount to, not to solutions, but to dissolutions, and possibly even transformations of these problems. But what I want to suggest is that implicit in the usual treatment of these questions is the presupposition that the others in question are human others. Even, it's, even if it's recognized that parallel questions arise regarding non-human animals, is there anything to understand about them? How can we understand them? Are our mental concepts univocal in application to humans and to animals? Such questions, at the very least, are not normally seen as within the scope of the problem of other minds. But perhaps less obviously, the usual treatment of these questions presupposes that the others in question are not just humans, but humans more or less like us. That is, adult, civilized, um, and mentally healthy. Uh, I, I can justify that if anybody wants me to do that. Uh, um, but again, 
Uh, however, questions parallel to the tradition, traditional problems of other minds, so-called, may be raised not just about animals, but about, and here I'm quoting from Bellefonte, children, primitive peoples, and madmen. I apologize for the phrases primitive peoples and madmen. Um, he was a man of his time, as we all are. Or person, <laughs> person. <laughs> of his time, at least. Um, and it's, it's these, uh, animals, children, primitive peoples, and madmen, that I mean to capture by my phrase, other others. Um, so mainly what I'm going to be doing is to elucidate uh, Meloponti's approach to the, to the understanding of these other others. Um, but because his response is to the more traditional problems of other minds, so-called, um, or uh, uh, introduce concepts that are important for addressing these, um, they're, um, I'm going <coughs> to briefly outline them too. Um, his approach to both sets of questions exemplifies his most renowned and incontroversial contribution to phenomenology, his reconceptualization of the body. Um, and interestingly, his approach to the problems of other others exemplifies another unique and controversial feature of his phenomenology, namely its detailed engagement with the so-called human sciences. Um, I want to say, first of all, though, a little bit more about what I mean by other others. Um, I've, I've had um, feminists of a certain stripe kind of um, say to me, well, but look, um, uh, you know, even within the category of adult, civilized, mentally healthy human beings, there are all kinds of important differences, you know, class, race, uh, race age, gender, ethnicity, etc. Um, and so, you know, aren't we all different? Um, so what is this distinction I'm trying to draw between um, others more or less like us and these other others? And it's saying, what, what I'm inclined to say is that um, uh, you know, phenomena, uh, I'm, I'm sort of just presupposing some vague understanding of phenomenology here, but um, but that phenomenology is sometimes naively thought of as describing experience, in which case the fact that you know, each of us has different experiences might might mean that we're all different in in a very important way. But it's really important to phenom that, that that phenomenology isn't simply describing experience, but aims at eliciting the essential structures of experience. Um, uh, and the claim is going to be that these other others, uh, and by the way, the term experience is not to be understood in the, the kind of um, naive empiricist way, according to which experience is a pluralizable term which designates the putative causal upshot in the mind of the perception of putative atomistic qualities of the world, that is, inner private atomistic objects, also known as sensations or impressions. That's not what experience means for, for phenomenologists. It's, we're, we're basically talking about the, the essential structures of the life world and of our being in the world. Um, but so therefore, the, the, the claim is not that um, just the other others are different from us, but that, that, but, there are, but that their way of being in the world uh, differs from ours structurally. Uh, I, and I'll give some examples of that without trying to define it. Um, basically, uh, the... Um, the experience of other others typically di di differs structurally from ours um, by being simpler or having fewer articulations. And from that perspective, it's, go uh, it's going to appear that their way of being in the world is lacking relative to ours. And yet, 
Meloponti is insistent that from its own perspective, such experience or way of being the world is a complete form of existence that is not lacking. Um, to take, take a simple analogy, um, if four-legged tables are the norm, a three-legged table will appear to be deficient, but both are stable. Each has its own equilibrium. Or to take another example from uh, Wittgenstein, um, a game of bits similar to chess, but simpler, for example, without pawns, um, shouldn't be seen as it, therefore incomplete. Um, it's in its own right complete. Um, but we'll say more about that. Um, I think there, uh, uh, okay, um, that's just kind of trying to say in general what, what I'm sort of heading at with these other others. Um, but going back to the traditional problems of so-called problems of other minds, um, Meloponti is going to say that the question and, and uh, just to, to remind you, I, I identified three different ones. And the first um, traditional problem of other minds is the question of how do we know that minds other than our own exist? Um, so Meloponti uh, basically identifies some presupp presuppositions uh, in the way that this question is normally treated which more or less inevitably lead to the answer that we don't know that minds other than our own exist, or any way that our knowledge is at best probable. And we might say that this answer is troubling at the very least, um, if only because it's unlivable. Um, so among these propositions are, first of all, the idea that the body is a mere object. And secondly, that there's a kind of asymmetry between my knowledge of my own, or at least my mind's existence, and my knowledge of others, or others' minds' existence. No, we'll notice, by the way, that the, the notion of mind kind of drops out in Malaponti's treatment. And I think that's really important and interesting and right. But, um, but so just to look at these two presuppositions in more detail and at Meloponti's ways of trying to tackle them. So treatment of this problem of others usually begins, however inexplicitly, with the idea that the body is a mere object, something like a Cartesian anatomical or physiological machine. Um, to we ask, uh, when we ask, how do we know that minds other than our own exist? Um, uh, it suggests that the issue of the knowledge of others' bodies and their existence has already been solved, or at least shelved alongside the general problem of the existence of the so-called external world. Um, so the issue is, traditionally, then how, how we know that that body um, uh, is associated with or animated by a mind, that, uh, that, that its movements are caused by or occasion by the mind. And uh, um, for those who know Meloponti, uh, a great deal of the phenomenology of perception is devoted to a reconceptualization of the body according to which it is precisely not such an object. Um, I will say just a little bit about that. Um, one, perhaps the most central concept, though I don't think it's the only central concept, in in his reconceptualization, uh, uh, reconceptualization of the body is his notion of the body schema. At its most basic, the body schema is a way of stating that my body is in the world. Um, and that's hyphenated by, as a reference to Heidegger's claim that human beings are being in the world. Uh, so his claim here is not, uh, is not just that human beings are in the world, but that bodies are in the world. And that's really important. Um, they're not just in the midst of the world as ordinary objects are. They're in the world and hence internally related to the world. And in Meloponti's thinking, that this implies, um, first of all, that the body schema is a, a system of equivalence. I'll explain what I mean by that. 
and that equivalent means equivalent for a particular purpose, so that we've got going a bodily teleology, and the crucial point will be that no mere object could possibly um, be or possess such a body schema. <coughs> and so, by the way, somebody said, one of the ethnomethodologists, I think, yesterday said that um, philosophers' examples are kind of just these kind of mere sketches or um, uh, which have no, no real detail or, or, or with reality. And Meloponti, as a philosopher, is um, a wonderful exception to this generalization about philosophers. Um, so he talks a great deal in, in, in much detail about um, what he calls motor habits, but we can think of them as, as skills, for example, the, the skill of driving. Um, to acquire a motor skill or a motor habit um, is to, it, uh, the acquisition of a, mo a motor habit is the rearrangement and renewal of the body schema. So that prior to becoming fully habituated to driving a car, I must explicitly calculate the width of a gap and judge whether the car will fit. Once this habit is sedimented in my body, I enter a narrow opening and I see that I can get through without comparing the width of the opening with that of the wings. Um, again, he's a man of his time. Um, <laughs> just as I can go through a doorway without checking the width of the doorway um, against that of my own body. Um, but to acquire a, a, a motor habit, that is to learn, never consists in being made uh, capable of repeating the same gesture Rather, it consists in providing an adapted response to the situation by different means. It, it, it's a new aptitude for resolving a, ser a series of problems of the same form. Um, so problems of the same form is the precise correlate of the body schema as a sy system of equivalents. That, remember, was one of the main characterizations of the body schema. To learn how to drive is to learn how to deal with problems of the form the car is about to stall, stall on this hill. And its solution, namely changing gears, has the same form whether I'm driving a right-hand drive or a left-hand drive car. Um, require, so it requires different gestures because requiring different hands. The gesture with my left hand and the gesture with my right hand are not identical, but in uh, systematically equivalent within the body schema. Um, that's part of his argument against um, a, a, a kind of um, a, 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 a against empiricism and be, uh, as as a, uh, and uh, uh, reflexes and so on as as uh, an account of uh, what's going on here. Um, but the notion of equivalence here, it should be clear, is a teleological notion. The gestures of you know, pushing down with my left hand and, and also simultaneously moving my foot against the, the, the clutch for those who drive that kind of car still, um, uh, the gestures are, uh, so they, 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 between my left hand and my right hand, uh, are equivalent for a particular problem solving purpose. Um, and just by the way, this is also why the switch from a left hand, a right hand drive car to a left hand drive car doesn't require my relearning to drive from scratch. Um, so the transfer transferability of habits or skills is premised on the body schema as a system of equivalents. Um, That notion of the body schema is, as I said, the most central notion, or one of the cent central notions in Meloponti's reconceptualization of the body. I'll say just a little bit, just to remind you where we are. We're talking about the first problem of other minds, and we're talking about the assumption which traditional philosophers make, uh, namely that the body is an object. And this is part of Meloponti's resistance to that um, picture of the body as, as a mere object. Another part, another assumption made by the way that philosophers treat that question 
is uh, the assumption that my own mind's existence is absolutely certain, whereas the existence of others or others' minds is not. And Merleau-Ponty resists that via what he calls the system self others things. Um, he argues first that my knowledge of my own existence and my knowledge of the existence of the world and the things in the world are exactly as certain as each other um, because my existence and that, and that of the world are intertwined. And he secondly makes a parallel argument about the existence of others and that of the world. Um, so there is no such uh, epistemological asymmetry. Um, I think I'm not even, just because of time considerations, I'm not going to go through that, but just to highlight um, a crucial feature of that way of resisting is the notion of what he calls the interworld. Um, uh, that is, the world that we encounter is an interworld, one shared with others. <coughs> Um, he partly gets this from the notion of the perspectivity of objects. That is to say, um, it's part of the essence of perception that, um, every, that each object, in a sense, is given um, from one, only one perspective. But that simultaneously, what is given when that one perspective is given is that it is visible from other perspectives. Um, uh, there's a whole horizon of unseen signs. Um, but, uh, but each, because uh, that perspectivity, but both the um, givenness of the one side and the givenness of the unseen sides are part of perception, um, each, and, and by walking around the object, uh, these new, uh, th these unseen signs become seen, and that's all part of the same thing. Um, uh, so um, uh, he says, we've learned in individual perception not to conceive our perspective views as independent of one another. So these different perspectives on the object slip into each other and are gathered together in the thing. And in like fashion, my perspective slip, slips spontaneously into that of others because both are, uh, so other peoples, both are gathered together in a single world in which we all par participate. Um, and he also, um, uh, perhaps even more important for the present audience, um, there's also a social and cultural layer of the interworld, as you might imagine. To learn what a cup or a chair or a walking horse is, is to learn how it is, it, it is used and to learn that is to learn how it is used by others. Um, so that uh, when um, the cultural objects which fall under my regard suddenly adapt themselves to my powers, awaken my intentions and make themselves understood by me, I'm then drawn into a coexistence of which I am not a unique con constituent. Uh, um, so, uh, the social world is a permanent field or dimension of existence. That's all. Uh, so, what he, as I said, so what Malapunti calls the system self others things is his way of resisting that there's a kind of asymmetry some, somehow between my knowledge of myself and my knowledge of others' uh, existence. Um, I'll say just a bit as well about uh, the second problem of others. Um, uh, traditional problem. Uh, that, that was the question, okay, so now we're no longer worried about whether others exist. Um, we've got us that far. Philosophers take a long time about these things. But um, there's the further question, okay, how do we understand others? And what, um, again, the way this question is normally addressed contains some pre presuppositions which Meloponti is at pains to challenge. One presupposition is again of an asymmetry. The, the idea is somehow that not only am I absolutely certain of my, my own existence, but I'm also absolutely transparent to myself. Whereas, um, so, so, so that I, I, uh, whereas with 
others, not only I, am I uncertain about whether they exist, but they're opaque to me. Um, and, but the, um, there are a number of presuppositions there too, but what I particularly want to call attention to is Malacorte's challenge to the idea that others are completely opaque to me. This would be so um, if the other's body were a mere object whose <coughs> movements were mere behavior. That is, behavior understood as the behaviorists understand it, um, reduced to the sum of reflexes and condition reflexes between which no intrinsic con uh, connection is permitted. So he writes a whole book called The Structure of Behavior, um, uh, in, in which he challenges the behaviorist conception of behavior. Um, briefly, um, uh, so uh, he, I mean, one way in which it's absolutely obvious that one might want to relate Wittgenstein and Mel Conti is in the way in which they both focus on behavior and they do so in a way that understands behavior in a way that is clearly not the way that behaviorists understand the term behavior. What, as I said, what Mel Conti does is actually write a whole book on the subject in which he's, you know, he really tries to make clear what the right way, a, a better way of understanding the term behavior is. And he makes three claims. Um, the first, this, he, he puts it this way, that behavior is a debate between the individual and, and the world. Um, what I take that to mean is that, um, that individual uh, and world are internally, um, in a certain sense, dialectically related. The, the, the point about this is, uh, that this is the first thing, the behaviorist notions of stimulus and response conceive the relation between world and behavior, uh, that is mere behavior, as external. But what Meloponti argues <coughs> is that, um, that we need to interpose between stimulus and reaction, what he calls the behavioral context or behavioral setting or milieu, um, um, th and the point about this is that the behavioral setting or milieu is structured by, by um, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll come to that point in a moment. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try and say a little bit more about what, what behavioral, what milieu in, in, involves. But um, it means that we can never sort of say stimulus response. We've really got to we've got to have the the context, the behavioral setting, the milieu in, um, between those. Um, um, but just to say a little bit more about what what um, uh, what the milieu is. The point about it is that the milieu is structured by the individuals valuations, um, the dialectical relationship between individual and setting or milieu is oriented towards a, a norm, what Kang Yim calls a, a vital norm. Um, the reaction depends on the vital significance rather than on the material properties of the stimulus. Um, so it's what the stimulus means to that human being or organism not on its material properties. Um, so the, the internal relation, we have an internal relation between behavior and milieu, which can be described as a relation of meaning. Um, uh, yeah, um, and hence, uh, we're already a very long distance from the behaviorist conception. And just one final property that I'll identify about um, behavior is that behavioral responses involve a kind of abstraction from the material properties of the geographical stimulus. Um, so uh, you're not, um, uh, you're not so much responding to the particular 
pro I, I mean, I respond to this part of water when I'm thirsty, um, and not as a material object, but as something which has a, a, a relation to, to my valuations and vital meanings and so on. But moreover, I respond to it not in general in terms of its it as a particular bottle, but it, uh, um, any container with water in it would do for my purposes. It's um, there's a kind of abstraction from from the uh, material stimulus. But so anyway, um, basically the thought is that behavior is not mere behavior, um, and that behavior and the yo are uh, uh, that is. Um, world as understood, or bit of the world as understood by the phenomenologists, are internally related, um, uh, which means that uh, we can understand others. Um, uh, they're not opaque to us because we can see their behavior in a meaningfully structured world. Um, to put it crudely, uh, but there's more to be said about this. I'm going to say just a, a little bit about the third traditional problem, uh, which is uh, you know, this conceptual problem of other minds. The, the, the worry is that, um, uh, that um, uh, uh, it's a worry about the unity of mental concepts, um, uh, according to which, um, you know, let's imagine, okay, so I can understand others by looking at their conduct or, or their behavior. Um, but uh, doesn't that mean that, my con that our mental concepts are still uh, somehow disunified? Because I don't understand myself through looking at my conduct. I, I understand myself by, um, however one wants to say, one understands what, what one's own mental life. Um, but what I want to, uh, so how, how can these concepts be unified? It seems to me that um, part of the, um, the, the, the main thing I want to call attention to here is that what one of Melo Ponti's most characteristic challenges to the traditional framework in which these problems are addressed is something we haven't really touched on at all yet because he wants to say that the oldest focus on concepts is not something that he thinks that in our ordinary understanding of others, at least others more or less like us, we do. We're not in the business of kind of applying mental concepts to others, or even applying concepts at all when we understand others. It, it, it's, for him, um, uh, less conceptualized than that. Um, primarily, and for the most part. Um, so, uh, Understanding others, at least primarily and for, for the most part, and at least when it comes to understanding others more or less like us, um, is not a matter of applying judgments, uh, applying concepts at all. Um, uh, the sense of someone's gestures is not given but understood. The whole difficulty is to conceive this understanding clearly without confusing it with the cognitive operation. Um, and his conception of this kind of understanding involves two closely linked claims. First, that the understanding in question is bodily, not intellectual or cognitive. And secondly, um, so he says, it's through my body that I understand other people. And secondly, that this bodily understanding involves a kind of reciprocity grounded in the body schema what we talked about earlier as a system of equivalence. We saw earlier that the body schema involved an equivalence between the gesture I make with my right hand and the gesture I make with my right, uh, left hand. They're equivalent for the purposes of certain kinds of problem solving. But my body and your body are also equivalent in our body schemas. Um, so he has this famous discussion of infants um, uh, the 15-month-old month ba baby opens its mouth if I playfully take one of its fingers between my teeth and pretend to bite it. The baby's response shows that it, in a perfectly clear sense, understands my biting intention. But this understanding can't very well be a cognitive operation. Um, 
the infant hardly possesses the, the sophisticated concepts um, uh, intends to bite, for example, the required here. Biting has immediately for it an intersubjective it, uh, its significance. Within the infant's body schema, the other's mouth, uh, mouth and its own are equivalent. The baby's own mouth and teeth, as it feels from them from the inside, are immediately for it an apparatus to bite with. And my jaw, as a baby sees it from the outside, is immediately for it capable of the same intentions. In effect, the infant perceives its intentions in its body and my body with its own, and thereby my intentions in its own body. Um, we're not infants, obviously, and we can't simply transfer these ob observations from the infant to the adult. Um, but um, the unsophisticated thinking of our er earliest years remains as an indispensable acquisition underlying that of maturity, he says. So even as an adult, I, I, as I've said already, uh, even as an adult, I primarily and for the most part understand others, at least others more or less like me, through, quote, the reciprocity of my intentions and the gestures of others, of my intentions and gestures discernible in the conduct of other people. It's as if the other person's intention inhabited my body and mine his. Um, so that's all by way of sort of background. Do I still have some time? Yes, you do. Okay. Because the, that, the, those notions I've been trying to introduce, on the one hand, well, so I've, I've tried to talk about several basic notions. Um, the reconceptualization of the body, and in particular the notion of the body schema, um, alongside that, the notion of the interworld, that is the world is given as already um, uh, shared with others. Um, but then the phenomenologically grounded concepts of conduct, which I'm using as to mean behavior properly understood, and uh, milieu, uh, those, those twin notions. And, but then finally this um, kind of pre-conceptual, non-conceptual, bodily, non-cognitive understanding that comes about through um, the body schema and what I call bodily reciprocity. Um, if we then think about these other others, um, the, but, but uh, basically, part of what I, it seems to me that Meloponti spends actually a great deal of time talking about these various categories of other others. Um, uh, but, um, but mostly, he's talking about them, if you like, as an observer. He, he's, um, he, he's taking his material from animal psychologists, child psychologists, um, abnormal, abnormal psychologists and psychiatrists, and anthropologists. And he's talking about them in terms of behavior or media, um, arguing, you know, that, that we can understand them in those ways. Uh, they're, 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 they show up as structurally different from, from us, but, but we can understand them. What he doesn't do, and this was what interested me in this particular, um, wh wh you know, when I originally wrote what I'm presenting to you here, he, he really doesn't talk about um, the kind of understanding that we might have of these other others bodily. He doesn't sort of suggest um, ways in which um, bodily reciprocity might be um, uh, the mode with which we understand other others. Um, and so, so he's kind of always when he talks about other others, he's in observation mode rather than participation mode. And I find that rather puzzling about him. And I do want to argue that um, participation with these other others, um, if I can use that distinction, um, really does allow us to have a kind of bodily reciprocity, an intercorporeity, to use another term that's 
um, phenomenologists sometimes use, um, a, 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 a intercorporeal understanding with these other others. Um, but uh, and I'll, let me just say a little bit about what Meloponte says in this kind of observer mode. Um, so um, the passage from which I took our paradigmatic other others reads um, more fully like this. The world is not just open to us, but also to animals, children, primitive peoples, and madmen who dwell in it after their own fashion. They too coexist in this world. Um, by this world, he means the world of perception. <coughs> by contrast with the world of science um, uh, and the whole, all of phenomenology perception. Um, tells us about that world. Um, so um, what, what, what I want to focus on is how, you know, how we understand these other others um, who also dwell in this world. I think that word dwelling is a very mellow word and very important. Um, and part, just part of what he does in th that passage, which I just quoted, is actually from, he's got a wonderful little tiny thing called the world of perception, which is from, uh, uh, he did a series of radio broadcasts, um, and that it's from that. And what he does in that particular lecture, he, um, and he's pointing to something which is really important, that most philosophers, when, you know, when they, you know, they talk about human beings, um, but, but somehow, they never really do talk about these other others who share, you know, who, who dwell, dwell in this world of perception alongside us. Um, and he kind of takes that to indicate, you know, he, 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 he suggests that it's because they have a very idealized conception of human beings as purely rational, and somehow um, purely thinking, and and how all their bodily existence and and their and and, uh, are, uh, and and their kind of intertwinement with the world um, is uh, really uh, is some, somehow less interesting than than, than their, their pure rationality, um, and I suspect that's right because if you think about the philosophers who do talk about animals, children. Primitive people and pr quote primitive people and quote madmen. Um, uh, there are precisely philosophers who don't conceive of human beings in any kind of idealized, abstract way. Um, but okay, so um, Melo Ponti says a great deal about a um, animals in his book, The Structure of Behavior. And he says a great deal about children. Partly because he actually um, lectured on child psychology and pedagogy at the Sorbonne. Um, he, he succeeded Piaget there. Um, uh, and he lectured there until his death. Um, but most of what he says about primitive peoples and madmen, he says, you know, there are scattered remarks in phenomenology perception, and there are scattered remarks in his lectures on child psychology and pedagogy. And it's partly because many psychologists and philosophers keep comparing children <coughs> to um, madmen. Uh, uh, to, for example, seeing um, uh, um, certain forms of aphasia as kind of equivalent to a child just as it's learning language. Um, and they also compare children to primitive, people, primitive peoples as if um, uh, prim quote, primitive peoples were kind of the child, you know, the children of mankind or something like this. Um, so he keeps coming back to those comparisons. But um, here I can finally sort of try and say so a little bit about um, uh, what I mean by um, structural differences in um, their ways of being in the world. But he, he he, he introduces a, a kind of methodological principle when he talks about these other others, 
um, we must conceive of the child, and it applies for the other, other others as well, we must conceive of the child neither as absolute other nor as the same. Um, and as a methodological principle, this circumvents the twin dangers um, on the one hand of so-called othering, of presupposing that these others are so other that um, not only would that put them beyond the reach of any understanding, but um, at least the way sociologists and anthropologists, that, that at least the ones I know, tend to use the term othering, it tends to be accompanied by disvaluation of these other others. Um, so the principle, we must conceive of these other others as neither wholly other nor as the same, circumvents the dangers of othering, but um, it also circumvents a danger of what might be called anthropomorphizing, um, although um, we normally apply that only when we're talking about animals. But so we're, we're not to treat an, um, hum, uh, animals as human beings, um, but nor are we to treat children as miniature adults, or as, or, or quote, primitive people as um, civilized people, monkey, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, none, uh, uh, at the same time, um, uh, the difference between us and these other others isn't simply a matter of degree. There are going to be structural differences between their ways of being in the world and ours. And it's clearer, clearest in his discussion of animals, um, simply because he has the most systematic discussion of just this point. Um, uh, so he, um, he argues that animals, um, he makes a distinction between the physical, the vital, and the human orders. Animals belong to the vital order, um, uh, not the physical order. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, so they exhibit conduct, not mere behavior and hence they inhabit a milieu, a world. Um, even an insect projects the norms of its milieu and lays down the terms of its vital problems. Um, but uh, the difference between the vital order and the human order, he suggests, is that the gestures of behavior, the intentions upon which the insect traces in the space, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the, the intentions which the gesture traces in the space around the animal, are directed to being for the animal, that is, to a certain media characteristic of the species, so that the kind of um, norms and values which um, an animal projects around itself in its world are species characteristic of the species. Um, I don't think we have to agree with him, but that's his claim. Um, as opposed to, with humans, um, it's, no, it's not an a priori of the species, as he puts it, but a matter of personal choice, which norms and values get projected in, in the world around us. But um, so he then, kind of on this basis, distinguishes between three forms of behavior, um, the syncretic, the immovable, and the symbolic. Um, the first two are found in the vital order, and the last is found only in the human order. Um, Syncretic behavior um, is imprisoned in the framework of its natural conditions, which release instinctive behavior. A movable forms of behavior allow the appearance of signals, which are, are not determined by the, the instinctual equipment of the species, so that um, a cat hears the sound of the tin being opened as a signal, time to eat. Um, that's not determined by ins the instinctual equipment of the species of a cat, um, for still with the immovable so-called behavior, um, the object appears clothed with a vector invested with a functional value, which depends on the effective composition of the field. Um, but if it's only capable of in, in immovable behavior, the animal cannot choose to adopt a different point of view to invest the object with a different functional value. Um, and whereas we can do that, um, symbolic forms of behavior have symbols rather than signals. 
um, and signals are liberated from the here and now relations and from the functional values which the needs of the species assign to them. So that's a kind of paradigm then of a structural difference between human beings and animals because um, human beings are like us in being part of the vital order and thus in um, having a milieu exhibiting conduct. Their milieus and conducts are structurally unlike ours insofar as their milieus are limited by the species given functional values and so insofar as animals correlatively are incapable of symbolic forms of behavior. That's going to be the paradigm. And um, he's, he wants to suggest, I mean, there are all kinds of difficulties one, one might raise. He wants to su suggest that children, primitive peoples, and madmen also differ, differ from the um, you know, adult, um, human adult, um, uh, mentally healthy, civilized person. Um, and I won't, uh, I, I, I mean, just to give a, a couple of indications, he says all kinds of really amazing things about children. Um, all, um, uh, for example, we talked earlier about the way in which the 15-month-old infant um, uh, which opens its mouth when I pretend to bite its finger, uh, in effect perceived my intentions in its own body. Um, and Meloponti suggests, he's drawing on people like Lacan here, obviously, but um, that uh, the, um, uh, the young child up to around age three, he says, has no awareness of himself or of others as private subjectivities. Now that sounds like a structural difference to me. That is to say, he doesn't, according to Meloponti, he's not fully making a distinction between I and other. Um, and that sounds like a structural difference um, in his way of being in the world. Um, there are others that, uh, other structural differences to which Meloponti points. Um, but as we've seen already, it's not that we make that distinction really sharply because um, that, um, uh, that point at, at which in our childhood um, we did not make that distinction between myself and the other as a private subjectivity remains as an indispensable acquisition in adulthood. Um, and that, that's really important to Meloponti that, um, that um, Again, we shouldn't think of us adults as fully, completely different from animals, children, primitive peoples, and madmen, and he, he, um, all over the place. And, and, and indeed, he values those aspects, those, um, those ways in which we retain connections with animals, primitive peoples, uh, children, and madmen. Um, in a way that, that is really, really striking. Um, um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm going to, I, 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 there, there, there are millions of more things that could be said about the details of the way that he, he goes through that. Um, I think what I'd really like to do, I mean, as I said, I was kind of interested, I, I think that what Meloponti says as an observer via these, con these concepts of, of behavior and media and suggesting that um, these other others ways of being in the world are structurally simpler than ours, um, typically simpler, um, but nonetheless not to be devalued on, on that basis partly because these ways of being in the world are complete in their own right, and partly because we too retain elements of, of, of these other ways of being in the world. Um, I, I think that's all really good and wonderful, um, but I'm also just kind of interested in the fact that he really focuses on, yeah, as I said earlier, on, on 
you know, he's he's looking at these other others from a um, uh, from a an observer rather than a participant way right, um, perspective, and it just seems to me that if he considered other others from a um, a, a participant perspective, um, he might have recognized that um, the kind of intercorporeity or bodily reciprocity that we um, retain from childhood, we actually have, I mean, we clearly have it in the case of um, children, animals, and arguably, um, uh, though it's difficult to say this for different reasons, primitive people than that madmen. Um, but, um, and you, you kind of wonder, I mean, we know, I mean, Mel Ponte had a child. Did he not reflect on the fact that, um, you know, he didn't just observe his child. Um, he immediately and bodily recognizes the child's distress um, or, or uh, jo joy or delight or interest or curiosity. Um, I mean, one thing that, uh, and, and had he been more attuned to tactile, um, understanding that uh, in phenomenology perception than he, than he was, um, uh, he might also have noted how we feel in a tactile way um, uh, when we pick up the crying infant. Our bodies feel its body's tension, and its body feels our body's um, reassuring strength and calm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when it comes to animals. Um, I think there's absolutely no question that animals whose lives are intertwined with ours, um, uh, and hence on whom we have what I'm calling this more participant rather than observer um, relation, um, we understand them not by sort of observing them and applying to them to them concepts of behavior in the or other wor much worse more behaviorist concepts. But um, we, uh, again, you pick up a, um, you stroke the cat and you feel its pleasure, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all so obvious that it, I find it quite extraordinary in a way that no one to talk about them. But um, I, was, I was just thinking that um, there, uh, just to start making a transition to thinking about uh, Wittgenstein, there are some wonderful passages um, isn't it striking um, that um, uh, he, there's a thing from RPP 1, 122 where he thinks a paradigmatic expression of well-being is a cat's purr. Uh, isn't that right? Um, uh, and uh, uh, this from PI um, 647, the natural expression of an intention Look at a cat when it stalks a bird. Right. So, so immediately I start thinking that uh, that um, there's a little bit more of this participation uh, uh, perspective in in Wittgenstein than there is in Mel Ponty. But I think there are, there are loads and loads of parallels. Um, I'm just going to say, do I so, do I have any time left? Um, Really, but no, but, 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 uh, yeah. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll simply say this. It is striking that exactly these same kinds of other others are, are things that both that Wittgenstein too kind of says lots of things about, unlike many, many philosophers. Um, and one thing, uh, again, I already called attention to their focus on. Uh, Behavior understood in a proper sense. Um, uh, I think that the ways, um, I, I mean, there were, what would be interesting to explore further is kind of why they're interested in these other others. But I, I will, I will stop there. So I haven't said very much about that in China. Um, <laughs>